Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our BSA webinar. We're happy to have you here. My name is Katherine Baxter. I am going to be the moderator for today's event. We have an all-star cast with us today. But before I get to our um, specifics, I'm going to give you a few housekeeping items to pay attention to. Please watch your screen. We'd like you to adjust the volume on your computer, please, so that you can hear this webinar. And also, if you need to resize these slides, you can drag the bottom right corner so that uh, you can view them well. Also, from this particular site, please allow pop-ups on your browser. You'll see that there is an Ask a Question feature on the left-hand uh, part of your console. Please submit your questions to us throughout the webinar. In fact, We'd appreciate it if you would address your question to the speaker. We'll announce the speakers as they come on. And uh, please submit those questions throughout the webinar. Don't wait until the end because we anticipate quite a large volume of questions because this is BSA. And also in approximately three weeks, this webinar is going to be closed captioned for on-demand viewing. Uh, for this particular webinar also, we will not have the slide deck available until it is downloaded in our learning management service. So you'll receive an announcement when that's available. I have as my host today Janet Carruthers. She's with the Office of Examination and Insurance, and I'm going to turn the calm over to her. Janet? Well, good afternoon. Um, we have some uh, great speakers today talking about the um, about the specialists, um, talking about customer due diligence and beneficial ownership. We have Sandra Soika. She is a regulatory policy officer from the Office of Regulatory Policy in the Policy Division at FinCEN. We also have Tom Lawler, a senior liaison officer in the Liaison Division at FinCEN. And then we have Andre Lucas, the Director of Compliance uh, in the Maryland, D.C. Credit Union Association. And my name is Janet Carruthers. I'm the Fraud and Risk Analysis Specialist in the Office of Examination and Insurance at NCUA. Thank you, Janet. I'm going to turn the calm over right now to Sandra. Sandra, you've got it. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, during our presentation, we will give you an overview of the customer due diligence rule, which Fenton published on May 11th of 2016. And if time permits, we will also um, highlight some key areas of the frequently asked questions we publish after the issuance of the rule. With that, I will turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, in the final rule, FinCEN identified four core elements of customer due diligence required to have an effective anti-money laundering program. The first, identification and verification of a customer's identity. As many of you know, is an existing requirement for credit unions under the Customer Identification Program rule. The second, identification and verification of the identity of the beneficial owners of legal entity customers at account opening is a new requirement. The third, understanding the nature and purpose of customer relationships, and the fourth, conducting ongoing monitoring to identify and report suspicious transactions and on a risk basis to maintain and update customer information are existing implicit requirements which are now explicitly required and are included as an additional prong of the AML program rule for credit unions. Next slide. The rule imposes a new requirement for credit unions and other covered financial institutions to collect information about the beneficial owners of legal entity customers when a legal entity customer opens a new account. The rule intends to make credit unions and other covered financial institutions less vulnerable to bad actors concealing their identities and hiding behind the shield of legal entities or corporate structures that can be used to facilitate money laundering and terrorist financing. Next slide. As everyone knows by now, the compliance date for the rule is May 11, 2018, meaning beginning on May 11, credit unions must begin to comply with these rules. Covered financial institutions were given two years to prepare and update their IT systems, 
client onboarding processes, policies, procedures, and address other operational issues. Next slide. Sandra. Currently, only five groups of financial institutions, including federally insured credit unions, are required to comply with the rule. Banks, broker dealers, mutual funds, futures commission merchants, and introducing brokers and commodities are also required to comply with the rule. Next slide. With respect to the new beneficial ownership requirements for legal entity customers, the rule is intended to make these legal entities more transparent and less vulnerable to nefarious actors. Next slide. There are two prongs in determining who is beneficial owner for purposes of the rule, the equity or ownership prong and a control prong. An equity owner is an individual, if any, who directs who directly or indirectly owns 25% or more of the equity interest of the legal entity customer, and the beneficial owner under the control prong is one individual with significant responsibility to control the management of the legal entity, including a chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, president, or any other individual who regularly performs similar functions. Under the equity ownership prong, there can be between zero to four beneficial owners. There must always be at least one individual identified under the control prong. Therefore, there will always be between one and five beneficial owners. Also, there may be instances when an equity owner is also identified as a control owner. Next slide. Credit unions can obtain the identification and verification information from the individual opening the account on behalf of the legal entity customer through a sample certification form provided with the rule or through other means so long as a credit union collects the name, date of birth, address, identification number, and the representative certifies to the accuracy of the information provided. Credit unions can also rely on this information provided by the representative of a legal entity customer so long as the credit union has no knowledge of the fact of facts that will call into question the reliability of the information received. Next slide. As for the verification requirement, credit unions must have written policies and procedures to verify the identity of the beneficial owner and not the status, meaning the credit union must verify that the beneficial ownership is an actual person, literally, that they actually exist. Credit unions may use procedures similar to their CIP or MIP procedures for individual customer. However, in contrast to CIP MIP requirements, the rule allows the use of copies of governmental identity documents such as driver's licenses. Again, as with the identification, credit unions may also rely on information provided by the legal entity customer Again, if it has no knowledge of facts that would cause it to question the reliability of such information. Back to Sandra. Next slide. For purposes of the rule, a legal entity is a corporation, limited liability company, general partner, limited partnership, business trust, or other entities created by the filing of the document with a secretary of state or similar office. Next slide. The rule provides a list of entities that are not included in the definition of entity of legal entity customer and for which credit unions are not required to obtain beneficial ownership information. These legal entities are generally excluded because they are required by their regulators to disclose or report their beneficial ownership information or information about their beneficial owners is publicly available. We will not go to the list because it is included in the rule, but we just want to mention that for you. Let's turn to slide 14. The rule also provides partial exclusion for certain full investment vehicles and for charities, allowing credit unions to obtain the beneficial ownership information for these legal entities under the control prong. 
The rule recognizes that the equity ownership structure of full investment vehicles are constantly changing and that charitable organizations generally do not have equity owners. Next slide. Credit union must obtain the required beneficial ownership information for accounts that are opened on or after May 11th of this year. There is no look back or retroactive review requirement. However, because of the amendments to the AML program rule, which requires credit unions to, on a risk basis, maintain and update customer information, credit unions must meet this requirement to comply with the rule. In essence, the requirement to obtain or update beneficial ownership information applies to pre-existing accounts. Next slide. The rule also provides exemptions with some limitations for four types of accounts which are considered to present low risk of, uh, a low risk of money laundering and terrorist financing. Next slide. Credit unions may rely on other financial institutions for compliance with the beneficial ownership requirements under the same conditions set for CIP MIP reliance. The record keeping requirement is also the same as CIP MIP. Identification records must be maintained for five years after the account is closed and descriptive information of verification documents must be maintained for five years after the record is made. Next slide. The requirement to obtain the beneficial ownership information of a legal entity customer is not intended to operate in isolation. Credit unions should use collected beneficial ownership information as they would use other customer information obtained through the CIP requirements, or MIP. As beneficial ownership information may be useful for compliance with other regulatory requirements, such as star filings. Next slide. As discussed in the beginning of the presentation, the May 11, 2016 rule, in addition to imposing a new beneficial ownership requirement for legal entity customers, also amended the AML program rule for credit unions. As a result of the May 2016 rule, a credit union's AML program must also include risk-based procedures for conducting ongoing customer due diligence, understanding the nature and purpose of customer relationships in order to create a customer risk profile, and conducting ongoing monitoring to identify and report suspicious transactions and on a risk basis to maintain and update customer information. Next slide. After the rule was issued in May 2016, Jensen published a set of frequently asked questions on July 19 of 2016. These FAQs summarize the most critical aspects of the final CDD rule, such as who are the beneficial owners, which financial institutions are subject to the rule, as well as the amendment made to the AML program rule for financial institutions. On April 3rd of this year, we published a second set of FAQs, which includes some of the most nuanced questions we've received from industry since the release of the 2016 FAQs. Both sets of FAQs or posted on the FinCEN website. Some of the questions we receive and which are included in the April 3rd FAQ includes questions on the certification requirement, CDs and loan renewals, collection of beneficial ownership information for pre-existing pre accounts, and CTL aggregation among numerous other questions. We will not go into the specific questions because the FAQ speaks for itself. So at this point, I will turn the floor over to Janet. Actually, we're going to turn the microphone over to Andre Lucas, the Director of Compliance 
with the Maryland, D.C. Credit Union Association so that he can on some things that credit unions may want to look out for. Andre? Well, thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to touch on a few areas that, uh, that credit unions probably should pay attention to or should have already paid attention to, some things that you want to consider to make sure that you're prepared for May 11, 2018. Uh, one of the things that, that is very critical is your risk assessment. Uh, make sure that you address your risk assessment because chances are you're going to wind up having some complex uh, business structures that uh, you open accounts with. Uh, it's, it's important to understand the, um, the indirect beneficial ownership piece, where you may, may have a beneficial owner that's not directly involved with that particular account that's been opened. Uh, update your training programs. Training programs are very important because we want to make sure that uh, the information is consistent across the board. Everyone involved in your training is understand how you're operating when it comes to business accounts and the business ownership piece. It's critical that you understand the direct and indirect ownership and also the product renewal service. Uh, these things uh, play a very important part in being in compliance with uh, the business ownership piece. Uh, you know, policies, procedures, processes, they should be definitive. Uh, make sure they're written. Uh, everyone understands them. They should be included in your training programs within your credit and your staff to understand, to understand what is expected of them when it comes to opening up your uh, beneficial ownership or investing in your beneficial ownership and opening up business accounts. Uh, understand uh, the things that, that uh, you have to retain for record retention when it comes to uh, identification and verification processes. Uh, looking at new account openings and ongoing due diligence uh, your account monitoring, make sure that's risk-based. All these things play a very important part in, in coming to being in compliance. Uh, look at your potential concerns. Uh, one of the major concerns is, uh, is overlooked a lot is your risk of non-compliance. Anytime you're lacking with your risk assessment or your training program's not in place, you open your credit union up to uh, a level of uh, risk of non-compliance and looking at serious enforcement actions behind these things happening. Uh, furthermore, you want to go ahead and prepare for your regulators because they may impose additional expectations when it comes to compliance with uh, the CDD rules coming out in there. Uh, and that's it for me, Catherine, at this point. If there's any questions. Thank you, Andre. We do have quite a few questions. And so I'm going to turn the microphone over to Janet Carruthers. She's going to start us off. And let's see what we have from our audience. Janet? Well, one of the first questions um, I just wanted to go ahead and address, we got a lot of questions about will the slides be downloaded. And so for those of you who um, joined us late, um, we will have those available um, within about three weeks so that you can go ahead and download those slides. Um, the first question is, has there been any exam procedures uh, published yet? Um, it's going through the process of being updated and um, as soon as the, um, we do this with the other agencies, uh, once the procedures are completed, they will be posted on NCUA's website uh, once they've been approved by all the different agencies. Um, the next question that we have, and this is um, going to go to um, either Tom or Sonia, um, have, for clarification, can, what is the definition of legal entity? Can you go over that again? I can go over that. Basically, in terms of the legal entity, we look at specific type of structure. And the rule defines a legal entity that is covered for purposes of the rule as a corporation, partnership, um, business trust that are um, created by a filing with a secretary of state or similar other entities. So there's a specific group of entities that are covered under the rule for purposes of the definition. Okay, um, here's another question um, again for Tom and Sonia. Um, could you please explain the rule for exiting the accounts again? In terms of exiting the account, we do not address specifically what institutions are required to do to exit an account. We leave that to the institution. What we do say is that institutions are required to obtain certain information in order to um, maintain an account open. Therefore, if the institution is not obtaining that information, that institution is not in compliance with the requirements, 
and the institution must have policies and procedures in place to address what they will do under those circumstances. Thank you. Um, Tom, this question is for you. Um, does the CDD rule apply to formal trust entities? Or if Sonia, if you can I, answer I can that. answer that. Okay. The CDD applies to trust entities that are created by a fouling with a Secretary of State. So if it's not created by a fouling with a Secretary of State, it does not apply. And if it is, yes, it does apply. Um, and here's another uh, question. Uh, can you expand uh, for Tom and Sonia on the Sunshine Club exemption? We will have to take this question um, back and we'll provide an, um, an explanation at a future okay. date. Okay. Okay, we do have quite a few questions. Um, let's see if we can go back and put Tom back in the hot seat. Um, here's a question here, Tom. I don't know if, Janet, if you asked this to Tom. Tom or Sandra, um, there was a question on can you clarify your comment on the requirement to perform verification for pre-existing account under the AML rule changes? Did you already answer that question? You didn't? No. Do you want to address it? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Please? It says, can you please clarify your comment on the requirement to perform verification for pre-existing account under the AML rule changes? In terms of pre-existing account, um, the, this, what we talked about before is the requirement um, amending the AML program rule, where we do say the rule does not apply retroactively and it doesn't require a look back, but because the 2016 rule amended the AML program rule to include a requirement for institutions to maintain and update customer information, which includes information about beneficial ownership of a customer. That requirement, the requirement to update applies to pre-existing accounts, albeit if the account, if you have an account that's open before May 11, it does not apply but because the rule requires you to maintain risk-based policies and procedures to update um, information about client information, including beneficial information, you will need to update that information if during the regular monitoring process, information disclosed on a risk basis that there may be a change in beneficial ship information. Um, so another, here's a good question is, um, let's see. Did you lose it? I lost it. I have one, uh, Janet, while you search for that one. Here's a nice question for our panel, whoever wants to chime in. The question is, does the rule apply to a single member LLC? Does the rule apply to a single member LLC? Again, the rule applies to certain entities, and that includes a limited liability company. If the single member um, LLC is created with a filing of Secretary of State, yes, the rule applies. Okay. Janet, did you find your? Uh, well, that actually was the one I was going to ask you, so <laughs> okay. we're thinking on the same way. Andre, we're not going to leave you out of this, so you have a specific question, which um, we've we pretty much answered, but when can we expect the updated exam manuals to be published? Which we talked about before, so I'm going to kind of steal your thunder. Um, the exam process has um, not been approved. It's going through the process of approval. Um, and once that is been approved, what will happen is we will post it on the NCUA website, um, and um, you will know it's still in the process. Uh, Andre, Andre, do you want to say that's, anything? That's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, there's no set date as to when it'll be updated, so okay. we really couldn't, we couldn't answer that question okay. right now. 
You know, we had another question, and I think it kind of disappeared. Um, it had to do to a church. Would the rule apply to a church organization, I guess? That's the question. Uh, all nonprofit entities, whether or not tax exempt, that are established as a nonprofit or a non stock corporation or a similar entity that has been uh, validly organized with proper state authority are excluded from the ownership prong of the requirement because nonprofit entities generally don't have any ownership interests. However, they are required to collect beneficial ownership information under the control prong for that entity. Okay, that was a good one. Um, I have one more really quick. Don't move anything yet. So here's another good question. Um, it has to do with certificates, I think. It says, can you clarify how to handle certificate renewal? So it says, when a certificate matures, no new suffix is created. It's no new relationship. So does that, would that trigger any of the requirements under the new rule for a certificate renewal? Good question. This question is specifically addressed in the March 3rd FAQ, where we basically talk about certificates of deposit and renewals, where we say each time a loan is renewed or a certificate of deposit is rolled over, the bank establishes another formal banking relationship and a new account is established. Therefore, institutions will have to collect information. And we also provide that, however, if the information is the same, it hasn't changed, and the customer certifies to that, and the bank is not aware of any facts that will call into question that information, the financial institution may rely on that previously obtained information. And lastly, we, uh, we provided additional relief by saying that if at the time of the renewal and the certification of the customer, the customer also agrees to provide updates to the bank of credit union as to when the information changes, that certification can serve as, that agreement can serve as a certification required. Okay, great. Thank you. Before I turn the uh, mic back over to Janet, because she has a, a bunch of questions, too. Here's a good one, I think, for Andre. Andre, uh, Credine said, what exactly should the BSA risk assessment be modified with? What would you recommend? Well, well, that's a good question, and that goes back to my first comment when I started speaking earlier, talking about complex business structures. You may run into a situation where you have one member or an entity that's an account with you, but there might be subsidiary companies that operate under that, and the beneficial owner could be and with the entity B or A, where it's just not the main um, company that has the account with the credit union. So, yeah, to be able to identify complex business structures when you're looking at these things. And also, again, then you want to still move forward with looking at volume activity, you know, uh, the type of uh, business that you have in place, uh, marijuana-related business, of course, create a higher risk. So you want to take a look at these things to make sure that, that you identify the, the level of risk and you put mitigation pieces in place to help mitigate that risk. Okay, we, we've received a, a lot of questions about um, identification and verification of beneficial owners and when a single legal entity customer opens multiple new accounts. Um, could you, Tom and Sonia, can you guys um, talk a little bit more about that? Certainly. Well, the beneficial... Beneficial ownership rule generally requires identification and verification, as Sandra had mentioned earlier, each time a customer opens a new account. Uh, in the FAQs, we step back from this requirement to allow financial institutions that have previously obtained a certificate form or certification form to rely on the previously obtained certification to fulfill the CDD requirements so long as the customer certifies or confirms that the information is up to date at each subsequent account opening and the financial institution 
uh, as we mentioned earlier, has no knowledge of the facts that would reasonably call into question the reliability of that information provided. Uh, thank you. Um, so here's a, another question. Um, we really haven't talked about this area, but is there a requirement that the beneficial ownership information, uh, both prongs, be kept electronically? We specifically address this topic and, and the role, not, not in the role itself, but in the preamble, and where we basically allow for institutions to obtain the information in any means um, that is um, consistent with the um, existing policies and procedures. We do not set a specific requirement. In fact, during the final rule, we, we specifically note that institution can use the certification form or any other means that is consistent um, so long as they obtain the required information. Thank you. Um, we've had actually a, a, a couple of questions on this. Is um, Does the customer due diligence apply to DBAs, the doing business as accounts? Okay, well, while, um, we, we also, I'm going to pass it down to Catherine um, while we'll write this one down. Um, so we can, um, you know, this may be something that we have Need to, to get back later. and address later. So. Okay. And so, and while we're doing that, I just want to, before I ask this question to Andre, because I think this is kind of a consulting question, and Andre is going to be able to address that best for us. Um, there's a question that's going to come up on the FAQ for April, question number 33, on the FAQ for FinCEN. So if you can, if you guys can take a look at that for a minute while I get this question to Andre. Andre, a credit union wants to know how is, what's the best way to sort of monitor a risk assessment or what is the best monitor for a risk assessment? They just want some information. And you do consulting with credit unions on that type of thing. What, do you, what would you say? Well, your, your risk assessment, monitoring your risk is, is an ongoing process, number one. Uh, if you read the FFIC exam, which is manual, it basically clearly states that, number one, anytime you have any major changes, new products, new services, uh, mergers, acquisitions, uh, and, and new, mem new mem membership, uh, increase in risk, you need to readdress your risk assessment. If there are no changes, your risk assessment should be addressed at least once every 12 to 18 months. However, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at uh, changes, that, that's not only changes in your products and services, that's also changes in volumes and frequencies. You know, when you have a, a large increase in monitoring type of transactions with your credit union, a lot of this goes back to how are you monitoring all the activity in your credit union. That, again, applies to updating the risk assessment when you see major changes, uh, an increase in, in wire transfers, uh, increase in dollar amounts. Uh, you, you're doing maybe 35 wire transfers a week now, and later on you might be doing 150 a week. Well, you just increase your level of risk because of the, the level of the, the frequency and wire transfers, and that goes along with, with the uh, also the dollars and volume frequency. So, yes, uh, that's an ongoing process, monitoring your risk within your credit union and keeping uh, you know, keeping it uh, a, a good monitoring system in place to where you're able to see and identify all the activity that's taking place and then change them to the place within your credit union. Make sure that you do update your, your risk assessment anytime you see any major changes like that. And again, you know, risk can go up and it can also go down. You have a decrease in your risk also as well as an increase. So in other words, the risk assessment or doing a risk assessment is not static. This is an ongoing process of updating. It's an ongoing process of updating. And like I said, even without changes, you're going to address that your risk assessment or review your risk at least once every 12 to 18 months. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Um, Janet, did you have anything that you, a question that you had down there you wanted to ask? Um, a couple of questions have come up about uh, can we get a soft review of the um, upcoming rulings that for NCUA examinations when it comes to CDD and beneficial ownerships. Um, uh, no, uh, w this is not going to um, come out. Um, once we do have everything finalized, it will be posted on the NCUA website, and at that point you can go ahead and look at that. There will no not be a soft ruling that comes out. 
Okay. Now, here's a very good question. All of the questions that are coming in, everyone, are great. Please continue to submit your questions. We will address them until we run out of time. And Andre really wants you to give him a lot of questions because he just likes to talk. Right, Andre? Here's a good question for Tom and for Sandra. (laughs) You know, credit unions do indirect lending. And so the question is, does this rule, how does it apply? And, Andre, you might want to jump in on this one, too. How does it, okay, let's let Andre answer. How about that one? How does this apply? How would you do it with an indirect lending basis? Um, so would the dealership get the information? Should the credit unions get the information on an indirect lending application or anything like that? Or when you're when we're applying this particular rule to um, the indirect lending po- portfolio, how would you address that? Well, if you're talking about indirect lending, I don't see where that's uh, you're looking at business accounts in that, in that area. Um, when indirect lending, that's a totally different uh, different uh, level of risk, a different uh, area when it comes to the, your your BSA program. So I need to clarify that a little bit more. We're talking uh, with the dealership because the the relationship with the dealership they they, they don't have an they don't have an account with the credit union. Correct. And so uh, I so need, you need I a need, bit more. Clarification. I need a little bit more clarification on I what gotcha. uh, or how you feel that applies to the new uh, CDD rule. Okay, gotcha. All right. So whoever, if you want to submit a little bit more information on that. Um, then maybe we could clarify and get you an answer on that. Yeah, we need to know actually who is the actual customer, who who is who is the member of the credit union then, and, and you know under the CDD rule, you know the mem- the the customer, the member is is not not even the uh, beneficial owner, is the is the business itself. Okay, I want to throw something at Janet. Um, there's a question here, and you may want to defer it to um, Tom or Sandra. It has to do with determining, maybe we should give it to Sandra and uh, Tom. It has to do with how do you verify the percentage of ownership to properly complete that first prong. Did we already address that? I I can address this question. It's Sandra. In terms of um, um, identifying the beneficial owner under the equity or ownership prong, the rule requires that financial institution obtains the information from the legal entity customer or its representative. And the financial institution can rely on the information um, provided by the legal entity customer so long as the credit union does not have any reason or any knowledge or fact that would call into question the reliability of the information. So credit unions um, are not required to prove or um, or verify the, the information necessarily. They just need to obtain it from the um, legal entity representative, and they can rely on that information so long as they have no reason to question the reliability of or the accuracy of the information. Okay. Um, if- so you've talked about a lot of these frequently asked questions, and a couple of people have asked where can they find them. Um, is it are they going to be on the FinCEN website? Yes, um, both sets of FAQs are posted on the FinCEN website under the guidance section. Thank you. Um, so is there? This is for for Tom and Sonia. Is there a requirement for recertification for the beneficial ownership every two years? The rule does not include, does not require recertification, but what it does require is that financial institution credit unions monitor and update the information on a risk basis. Okay. So you're throwing the ball back to me. I got you. All right. So here we go. Here's another question. We may have addressed this, but you know what? Since we got it again and it just disappeared. The per, the credit union wanted to know about trust accounts. But the question actually disappeared. So I'll have to ask you another one. So Oh, 
here we go. I'm sorry. We had a question about a sole proprietor. How does the rule apply, apply with a sole proprietor? So I think Tom or Sandra is going to answer that question for us. The rule does not apply to sole proprietors because, again, the identity of the sole proprietor is connected with the entity itself. Um, it, the rule does not apply to individual accounts or accounts for sole proprietors. So we had another question. I'm not sure I, I really understand this, but maybe when I read it, it might ring a bell. So the credit union said, when do we expect to see the adoption of the customer due diligence rule? The rule is effective as um, 2016. However, the compliance date is, is on May 11 of this year. So beginning on May 11, credit unions must comply with the rule. Okay, I've got a tricky question. I love tricky questions. I've got one. We, you mentioned sole proprietorships, but this one has a caveat to it. So the credit union said the member forms a sole proprietor to operate the business instead of a corporation or LLC to circumvent the CDD rule. Well, unless the institution is aware that um, the member is actually doing that, um, but the rule again does not cover sole proprietors. It may, it, it may be a situation where if the credit union is is aware that this is a suspicious transaction and the circumstances call for it, the institution may file a saw. But again, it doesn't cover um, sole proprietors. And um, so here's a, a question just to, to, to re-go over this. Should the, the person who signs the certification form be the person who's opening the new account? Well, the rule does require that the individual opening the account for the institution, for the legal entity customer certifies to the accuracy of the information. So they are, when by their certification, they are basically saying, to the best of my knowledge, this information is accurate. So they, that person must be the one um, opening the account. And this is kind of a follow-on to that. Um, are there any criminal laws that will affect um, employees for not collecting the required information? I cannot address criminal law questions. <laughs> Oops. All right. Um, so now here's, a, here's another question. This is an interesting question, too. The credit union says, how does this affect CTR and SAR filing when it comes to information that needs to be provided? Do we have to include beneficial owner information? Well, as far as CTR, um, as, let me first step back to SAR. For, and as far as SAR filing, um, we do say that the information you collect, um, the beneficial ownership information that you collect can be useful for the um, reporting of suspicious transactions. And in fact, if credit unions has information about a beneficial owner and if or the customer and there is information that is suspicious and requiring a filing of a SAW, the credit union is expected to file the SAW. And as far as CTR filing, the general rule is that financial institution must aggregate multiple currency transactions if the financial institution has knowledge that the multiple transactions are by or on behalf of any person and results in either cash in or cash out totaling more than $10,000. And for businesses with common owners, financial institution and credit union should not aggregate transactions involving businesses with those of each other or with those of the common owner or beneficial owner. Um, therefore, unless there's an 
affirmative reason to believe otherwise, financial institutions should re- um, presume that different businesses that share a common owner are operating independently, independently and separately. Just a second. We have another question. Um, it, it says, are we required to run OFAC on beneficial owners or only collect and record their information? Uh, we will not speak directly to, to the OFAC requirements, but what we do say is that the information collected on beneficial owners may be useful in compliance with OFAC regulations so um, what I would suggest is specific questions related to OFAC compliance be directed to OFAC. Uh, thank you. Um, so that one of the other questions is where can we get the form for customer due diligence? The sample form is also listed on the FENCEN website. In fact, with the publication of the latest FAQ guidance we um, submitted or we posted on the website a fillable form which institutions who do prefer to use can use. Um, We have another question that um, says, do we need to run our beneficial owners through 314A? Ben, uh, the 314A do not require that institution um, conduct searches for beneficial owners. That being said, if an institution receives information, um, a, a request specifically on a beneficial owner, or if, inf- if a credit union has information that meets the specification of the request, they should... Um, submit that information. Um, this, this question is uh, one of those complex questions that Catherine really likes. Um, if we get a indirect loan application under the business account, does the dealership collect the information on who the beneficial owners are? And that's the one that we have extra information on because okay. that's the one we sent to Andre. Oh, So the credit union replied or okay. somebody replied with some information to help address that a Wonderful. little bit better. You ready? I think that question, what I saw is a little bit different, too, because there might even be more because they're talking okay. about um, uh, another question. But yours, as far as the indirect lending, uh, and is the, is, the, is the indirect, can you repeat that, please? Uh, it says um, if we get an indirect loan application under the business account, does the dealership collect the information on who the beneficial owners are? Okay. One thing the credit union needs to remember is that the liability will always lie on the credit union to make sure that that information is obtained. Uh, you can outsource, uh, you know, some responsibility, and it can be in your agreement with the dealership, but the liability will always fall back on the credit union to make sure that that information is obtained. Okay. All thank right. you. Yeah. And. I would also add, in terms of indirect lending, depending on how the account is established, if the account is established ultimately with the borrower, then um, um, and the borrower is an individual, it would not um, be covered under the customer due diligence rule. But at the end of the day, if the account opener is a legal entity and the loan is being made to that legal entity, then um, the credit union should be conducting CDD. So, Sandra, you know, we have a lot of people, I think you mentioned it already, but let's mention it again. We have a lot of credit unions asking about where they can find the Q&A information on FinCEN's site. Can you just give them a shortcut? When they go to FinCEN.gov, what's the shortcut, if you know it? The shortcut will be to go under regulations and then guidance, and we can also post that information for you. We'll provide that information, the exact site to get the FAQs. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go back to Andre uh, the, on the um, indirect lending question because we had a member that also, if I may just jump in, I'm sure, sorry, Catherine. I just want to give the exact site. It's www.fencen/resources/statutes-regulations/guidance. Frequently asked questions regarding customer due diligence. Hopefully, that helps. And Thanks. if you couldn't write that all down, if you go to our guidance. Uh, it's the, the FinCEN 2018-G001. It'll be listed there. Okay. Now let's scroll back to this indirect lending question, see if we can get it out. Okay. So here's the example that the, the credit union gives. He said when a new member joins through an act of an indirect loan, they also open a primary share deposit account the individual or individuals become their member through that new small savings account and the indirect auto loan open the same day. So it's, the question is more about not the, necessarily the beneficial owner, but the due diligence for their, for their consumer members. Can you address that from an indirect standpoint? Was that clear as mud? Okay. Let me try it again. Yeah, let's try this again. Okay. Because when I read it, it was a little different. It had something to do with loan participation and getting the benefits. There's ownership. another question about loan participation. There's another question. Okay. This is different. Stay with me. You ready? Okay. Okay. So the person, they're giving a, an example. Mm -hmm. They said, here you have a brand new member that joins through an indirect loan. They join the credit union through an indirect loan by opening a primary share account. So now they're a member. So the individual or individuals that become the member through the small savings account and the indirect auto loan, they're open on the same day. So the question they said is not about the beneficial owner, but more about the due diligence for our consumer members. Is that any clearer? Well, is that, if that's through, like my last answer was, if it's through the indirect, indirect lending program, all okay. right, then it, it'll be... The liability is on the credit union to make sure that they do all their due diligence by identifying their member, okay, and and, and documenting all the identification and verification uh, procedures that they have in place. Did you want to add some yeah, more? That, well, yeah, that's that, that, that's under the individual membership piece. That's not due diligence. That's your regular due diligence for your membership. Okay. That's not the due diligence uh, following the, the upcoming due diligence rule. Okay. But that was the, be their normal due diligence when they open up an account uh, that they're going to identify the individual, they're going to verify the the the, uh, the, the uh, person's identity, and they're going to follow their record keeping procedures and also their risk rating process, the risk rating of the individual. How'd you like being on that hot seat? Was that mm -hmm. fun? Yeah. Here's I'm, another I'm one. Stay on it. Here's another one. For we me? got more questions. We've got a ton of questions, folks. We only have five minutes though, so if you haven't asked the question. Ask it now or forever hold your peace. So here's a question. But this one, guess what, Andre? I'm going to take you off the hot seat. I'm going to put Tom in it. Tom, here you go. You ready? The credit union says, does the control person need to be a signer on the account? The control person, and, and I'm, if I may answer this, the control person does not need to be a signer on the account. It's just me, the rule record that the control person has managerial responsibility over the legal entity customer and its account, but it does not need to be a signer. All right. I've got a wonderful question for the panel. This is a great question. The credit union is putting everybody on the spot. The credit union said, and, and Janet's getting worried, they're putting everyone on the spot. They said, just to clarify, is there a difference in the terms beneficial owner versus owner versus controller versus ultimate beneficial owner? And for purposes of the role, a beneficial owner is identified as um, someone with an equity interest of 25% or more and the legal entity customers. So there's a specific definition under the rule. And also a beneficial owner is a control person 
who is could be an individual who's a manager who has managerial responsibility over the the legal entity customer. So therefore, for purposes of the rule, we need to look at the definition of the rule to determine who's a beneficial owner. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that we have is for identification purposes, um, does a beneficial owner need to be run through check systems? Anyone who would like to answer that question? <laughs> Andre, do you want to answer Andre, that? Andre, do you want to answer that question? Well, you know, in, in your beneficial ownership process, is basically the same process as you, in your regular customer identification procedures. Uh, so if that, pro if that process is to run the check systems, OPAC and whatever else, yes, you're going to do that. Now, you know what, um, Janet, I have a, another really good question. I like these complex ones. Let's pick on the Girl Scouts. You ready? Here we go. How should we handle organizations like the Girl Scouts, where we get individual troops, but they are all owned by a larger incorporated council that is nowhere near our credit union? I think that question was very similar to the the sunny questions, the sunny groups is what previously. So it's like, uh, and the Girl Scout troop question has come up. Actually, we've had two or three of those questions to asking about the Girl Scout troop or the Boy Scout troop questions. So can we give sort of a an answer that would kind of encapsulate all of those type of entities? Is there like a one good question? so that everyone, because basically we're getting the same type of question yeah. on the same thing. What we do say is that unassociated, um, associ unassociated um, companies, companies, entities, or not so much as entities, are not covered by the rule. Charities that are covered by the rule or charities that are pre, um, that are, that fall, that meets the requirement of the, ex um, the partial exclusion um, in the rule. Well, guess what, everyone? We are fresh out of time, and we still have a lot of questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a listing of the questions that we haven't answered, and hopefully once we post the webinar to our learning management service, those credit unions that would like to see the webinar again and would like to have the Q&A again, would like to load down the slide deck and would like to get the answers to some of those questions, you can log into our learning management service and you can find out all of that, all of those answers that we missed. So if you look at our contact page, for any questions about our LMS, you'll contact us at curelms at ncua.gov. Thank you so much to our speaker, to Janet for being my host, Janet Carruthers, for Sandra Sword. Sochka, did I get it right? Yes. Sochka. Okay. And for Tom Loyler, they're both with FinCEN. And for my good buddy, Andre Lucas. I'm just kidding, Andre. With the Maryland, D.C. Credit Union Association. I'd also like to thank Franz Ayento, who is our behind the scenes guy here at NCUA. And also Patty Hunt, who's been helping me with our QA. So everybody, we're going to sign off right now, and thank you so much for joining us. Remember, we should have this available in approximately three weeks. Until that time, join us next month for our CDFI webinar on May 16th. This is Katherine Baxter. I'm signing off. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great week.